You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as uh, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Actually, it's the, it's the lead play in our, in our offense. What's up, gang? Welcome into Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. We joined alongside tonight my buddy Jacob from the Packernet Fantasy Podcast. We got Tim in Green Bay. It's official 53-man roster day, fellas. We made it. We made it. We've got a roster put together. Now, I will say this. We know all of that's going to change really, really quick in the next couple of days. There's going to be some shuffling around, right? But I do want to give a quick shout-out to Old Southern Barbecue Smokehouse, uh, the official sponsor of Packernet Podcast. Look at that hat right there. I'm, I'm telling, I got to get got to get a hold of some of that merch, and we got to get our listeners some of that merch as well. So, let's do this, man. Let's waste no time. Let's jump right into the 53. Um, just coming through the comments, we got people already commenting about it, guys. This one right here, <laughs> it's spot on. This was one of my takes, Eric. I'm going to talk about it here in a second. And there's really only one thing to say. Oh no, man. That's yeah. exactly <laughs> the way I feel about it. Just got, nah. Listen, I'm sure he's a great guy, but that one didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, so shout out to Eric. We got Zane in the chat. Uh, let's see here. We've got Paul. We've got Blake. Man, we got a full house. Brad, Nick the Realtor in the house. Smitty, M. Smitty, Brian W. The whole crew is here, guys. The whole crew is here. John Stroman, Elevated Shine. Elevated Shine with his patent uh, profile pic there at Prison, Mike. You got to love that. Elevated Shine is this is for you right here, All my right, friend. Hey, 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 hey. That's just the way we talk in the clink. <laughs> there you go. We're ready to roll, fellas. We are ready to roll. All right. Let's get down to it. Let's talk about the offense first. That sound good, guys? Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeesh. Offensive side of the ball. I'm just going to kind of give a few of my takeaways, some some things I'm excited about, maybe some things that I disagreed with, and uh, and we'll kind of turn it over to you guys and get your takes as well. Starting off at the quarterback position, everybody's excited about Jordan Love, obviously. He's shown – quite a bit of flash in the preseason. I think he's a lot years ahead of where he was, you know, the last couple of years. But the thing that that really gets me excited, and I've mentioned this on this pod several times, Sean Clifford, you know, if for some reason Jordan Love has to miss time, and I know we don't want that. If he does, I'm pretty confident that Sean Clifford, as a rookie, can step in with all that experience he's had as what whatever it was, a a sixth-year senior because of the COVID year uh, in college. Uh, All the snaps he's taken, he's taken significantly – uh, more snaps than Jordan Love when it comes to his football career. I think he can step in on a pitch and 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 really just kind of pitch in and and provide decent football and and give us some exciting you know uh, play. I guess you could say. You know, in the past we've had you know backup quarterbacks. You know, not to knock them or anything, but your Tim Boyles, right, and your Deshaun Kaisers and and of the of the world. And it's like as soon as Aaron went down, it was like my God, this you know we have no shot. 
with Sean Clifford, <clears throat> you get a little bit of that that Brett Favre mystique almost, right? And I'm not trying to compare him to a Hall of Famer, but I think that's going to be something that's going to be fun to watch. At the running back position, the big shocker for everyone, Emmanuel Wilson has made the roster. This is really exciting. I'm wondering how long he'll stay on the 53. It's obvious that they were concerned that someone may try to pick him up. So uh, that's probably why they, they put him on the 53 so someone else didn't grab him. But he's just very dynamic with the ball in his hands. I think he's going to be one of those backs that, if for some reason, you know, uh, something happens to Aaron Jones briefly and A.J. Dillon, we're just running running him down the defense's throat, that we have to put uh, Emmanuel Wilson in. I think he's someone that you could, you know, maybe if you're sitting on a lead late in the game too, just run Emmanuel Wilson behind that starting offensive line. I think it would be exciting to watch. At the wide receiver position, the thing that stood out to me was Malik Heath and Tay Wicks. You know, we pretty much called the receiver room. Nothing surprised us there, gang. You know, you heard our episode last night. Um, everything kind of fell into place. Malik Heath and, and Tay Wicks, to me, they provide great depth. And I know they're both very, very, very young, but they've shown enough in preseason and in training camp that I look at those two guys. Tay Wicks is already a really good route runner. You can see it on tape. The tape doesn't lie, guys. It's one thing to say, oh, well, he had a good padded stat line in a preseason game, or he made a flash catch, you know, one or two catches in training camp. But when you watch his footwork, when you watch how he runs routes, it's exactly what Greg Cosell was talking about. He, I mean, Greg Cosell was just literally saying, this kid gets it. That's what stood out to me about, about Greg Cosell talking about um, Tay Wick. So I'm excited to, to see those two. And Malik Heath, just one of those guys who doesn't play scared. Even as a rookie, he's going to go across the middle. He's going to take his licks, and he's going to keep on moving. Tied in, Luke Musgrave, he will be forced to fast track this year. There's no doubt about it. There's I, something that I've despised in the past is, oh, well, it's a rookie tight end. It's a young tight end. It takes time to develop, and we got to ease them into the role. I love that Luke Musgrave is getting thrown into the fire, and he's someone who's just going to go out there and be forced to pick up this offense, be forced to to win and get better. And there's going to be there's going to be down moments, but there's also going to be those flash plays where he gets behind the defense or he has that that hot uh, hot miss uh, this. Uh, advantage over a defender, over a small DB in a one-on-one -on -one matchup. You're going to see those moments, and, and the question is going to be, will he rise to the occasion or we, will he kind of uh, play like a rookie? I'm excited to see how that rolls. Um, and offensive line, Rashid Walker and Yash, gang, that's that's pretty solid depth at the tackle position. You know, Yash was a starter at right tackle last year. Now, we've seen he took a step back toward the end of the year, uh, but I think Yash and, uh, and Rashid Walker especially – if something happens to a tackle, I feel pretty good about our backup tackle step, stepping in as opposed to uh, in the past. And and the one negative I will say about the offensive side, and we already kind of talked about it there with Eric in the chat. He took the words out of my mouth. Royce Newman, guys, he doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me that he's on this roster. You've seen how bad he played last year. You've seen how bad he played in the preseason. We've seen how bad he played in family night. And I don't mean to dog on the guy, but I just don't, I don't understand them keeping him. Um, you know, with with all the other guys that they have on this roster, it's like at what point will you have to go to Royce Newman, right? You've got a third round pick in Sean Ryan, which people have at training camp have reported that he's looked a lot better this year than last year. You've got a little bit of depth there. I don't, I really, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to keep Royce Newman. So offensively, Jacob, what sticks out to you the most, man? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's got to be the the Wilson. Um, I, I was a little bit surprised that we kept 11 you know i was talking about how we could get away with something crazy like keeping eight if we wanted to man tangle like you said maybe doing some some weird kind of back alley moves to see if we could sneak guys here and put them on ir there or do the pup list kind of musical chairs type thing but um we ended up keeping 11 what is interesting not to just jump off but the vikings just because i took a peek at what the other guys did in the nfc north the vikings are going into their initial 53 with only eight alignment. So it does happen. I'm just saying, not crazy. Uh, but the other thing was that um, I did think that we maybe were going to have a seventh wide receiver, but it seems really cool that they felt more confident in um, having that three running back set. Like we talked about, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's going to stick that way, but it's, it's cool. It sounded like to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that Tenuta made the team, but it's almost a pretty much a guarantee that they're going to move him to IR tomorrow. That's kind of the vibe I get, yeah. It sounds like that that's going to be replaced. His spot will be replaced by Orzec, the, the long snapper, because at the moment we technically do not have a long snapper on the spot, if I'm not mistaken. They're going to have to pull a drunk out of Section 125 to go down there and snap the ball as we sit there right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you got anything else, Jacob, on offense? Uh, yeah, I mean, like you said, man, Newman, that one surprised me. I thought that really we would keep uh, – I thought we were going to keep Empey just because – 
Yeah. I really did thought, I think that that was going to happen. And um, like you talked about, it's just, I think we've seen what we need to see out of Royce. He's, he's shown that his peak was his rookie year. And after that, it's just been a kind of slow and steady descent into beyond mediocrity. It's, 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 uh, it's unimpressive. So I don't know, maybe you keep him on there just in a pinch, but to me, yeah, keeping an 11 was surprising when, it's, when one of those 11 is, is Newman for sure. Got it. Got it. Before we go to Tim here, I want to give a special shout out to Josh Martin with the super chat. Hey man, thanks for supporting the stream. He said, I'm not a big fan of three running backs. I'd rather have a fifth corner. If a cornerback goes down, we're screwed during the game. You know, I was, I was all for just keeping two running backs as well. And if you had asked me yesterday, which it's pretty much what we talked about on the stream, I kept two running backs and kept five corners. So I completely agree with you, Josh. Um, but at the same time, th they kept Emmanuel Wilson for a reason, you know, and, and immediately my mind starts to, you know, reverse engineer, okay, they caught wind that there were several teams onto Emmanuel Wilson. That's the only thing I can come up with. So with that being said, when you talk about the corners that they had to let go, keep in mind – you're, you're probably going to see the practice squad come back heavy with cornerbacks, right? So the question becomes, who is another team more likely to pick up? That running back, Emmanuel Wilson, or one of those cornerbacks that, you know, in my in my opinion, when you get down below those top four, everybody's kind of even. you got three or four options there, right? At least two of those are going to make it to the practice squad, if not all of them, if they want them all on the practice squad. So at any point, they can elevate one of those corners if a corner does go down. Now, if you're talking strategically – you know, in a game, in live action, oh, man, we now we're down to, you know, only three corners and we got to go to a dime set, you're heavy on safety. And I know I think the same thing. You just went, but our safety suck. I got you, man. I completely agree with, with what you're saying. But um, that would be my guess, Josh, is that they caught wind that, that multiple people were on uh, to Emmanuel Wilson, and they knew that that next tier of corners on the roster were probably – dead even so they knew okay we can bring one of those guys back on the practice squad but again josh thank you so much for the super chat we appreciate you man tim offensively dude what stands out to you about this roster i mean clearly the what we just talked about we've all i think we all have the same take on this emmanuel wilson making the team is is um pretty surprising i think um i thought they would have kept two for sure uh, but we we did kind of think that this could have happened also, and clearly there's merit. It you know he had a hell of a preseason and a hell of a camp, so you know we were that's a protection move clearly. Um, Samari Ture made the cut, guys. You know I mean that shouldn't really be a standout, but we we kind of discussed um, the possibility of even him maybe being bumped down a notch or so. But um, all in all, man, I'm I'm pretty happy offensively, other than. You know, again, Newman. I kind of felt like, you know, with, with Sean Ryan taking Hello, the, Newman. <laughs> <laughs> with Sean Ryan taking that step step up that he did this year, I thought maybe that would have would have been the the thing that did Royce in. Uh, but apparently not, because they're both on this team. Um and uh yeah, letting go of Empey was a little shocking too, as far as uh, you know, center kind of uh backup scenario. So I don't know what the contingency plan is uh, with with uh, guys like Newman and, um, you know, even the inconsistencies we talked about with Josh Myers. Uh, so we'll we'll see what goes on. But all in all, I'm pretty, pretty happy with the offense. Yeah, I agree, man. I agree. I think it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be a fun year. we got a lot of young talent and a lot of people that are going to be, uh, you know, kind of fighting for uh, fighting for game time. Right. Playing time. And. I don't know. I think that when you have competition across the board, like they do, you know, the, in my opinion, the worst receiver on this 53 man roster, isn't that far away from the best receiver on this 53 man roster. I mean, when you look at the way Malik Heath played you, if you were to put him in the same exact situations as a Romeo Dobbs, I don't think it's a huge drop off. Now, Romeo Dobbs could take that major step forward, which we've seen that flash in the preseason. And hopefully that hamstring hamstring seems to be healthy based off of, how everything looks, you know, with the 53. So, um, man, Chicago game can't get here quick enough, guys. Let's do this. Let's move on to defense. Uh, but before we do, we do want to give, like I said, a shout-out to the official sponsor of Packernet Podcast, and that is Old Southern Barbecue Smokehouse. They got five locations in Rice Lake, Hudson, Arden Hills, Minneapolis, and Shakopee. And you can check out their website, www.oldsouthernbarbecue.com. Really appreciate them supporting 
the uh, the channel and everything that we're doing. It's going to be an awesome partnership. That's actually officially coming up September 1st and uh, going to be really, really cool having them on board with Packernet Podcast for sure. Let's move on to defense. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, I'm just going to kind of rattle off my notes here, what I came away with, gang. Um, defensive line, TJ Slayton, in my opinion, he's taken major steps forward. Um, the question is, will it continue, right? You've seen it this preseason. You've seen it toward the end of the year last year. He's starting to show a quicker burst. He's learned how to use his hands well. Um, he's able to eat up those double teams. We've now been been able to move Kenny out of the nose, really starting pretty much all of last year. Kenny was out of the nose tackle position because TJ Slayton's been able to step into that position. What that does is free Kenny Clark up to be that three tech that we talk about is so valuable across the NFL. And what I mean by three tech, you know, basically with your with your techs, you've got, you know, if you're lined up at nose, you're playing shade over the center, that's a zero tech. If you're playing over top of one of the two guards, that's a two tech, right? The three tech is in between the guards and the tackle. And what it does is it forces a one-on-one matchup. It's, it's much harder to double team a three tech off the offensive line simply because we play with what we call wide fronts. We play with wide seven and wide nine fronts with our outside linebackers, with our edge defenders. So what you essentially have is you've got to pick your poison. They've got to decide, are we going to move the center over to help block the three tech who is all one complete gap over, right? So keep in mind, he's lined up. Kenny will be lined up majority of the time. Uh, when we're in nickel, he'll, he'll play a little more one tech than three. But when we're in our base, imagine him being in between the guard and the tackle. Now, how are you going to double team Kenny with the center and the guard? The guard has to get to his outside shoulder. So what it is, it's an isolation move. And TJ Slayton stepping into that role as nose tackle is what's going to allow that that uh, that upgrade to take place, essentially. So TJ Slayton is going to be the key to this defensive front, in my opinion. Of course, we got uh, Devontae Wyatt playing on the opposite side in that base 34. Um, Carl Brooks, I think, will have an impact this season. Everything I've seen, you know, he had a, a very high PFF grade in college, and everybody immediately said, oh, it's it was a smaller college. He comes into training camp. He flashed every single day you heard his name mentioned. I couldn't tell you how many times. He was one of the three players of the day for Andy Herman. And then all of a sudden it was, well, it's just training camp. We get into the preseason games. He flashes in the preseason games. I'm telling you, we get into the regular season. Do not be surprised if Carl Brooks works himself into this rotation and he is an impact player on this defensive line. I'm telling you it's going to happen. Uh, at the edge room, I think we've got one of the one of the deepest edge rooms in the entire National Football League. I mean, when you look at it across the board, Enigbare looks like he's starter ready. He looks like a guy who could play starting edge for the large majority of the NFL teams across the league. Right? I'm not saying he's a number one edge defender on a team, but I'm telling you, he is right up there in the top ten of number two edge defenders on each team. He's he's someone who's established himself there. Uh, Van Ness with his versatility, if for some reason – we get in injury trouble on the defensive line. We go to a nickel. He's got the versatility that he can kick inside, and his his traits, his physical ability, actually, um, it, it actually points in that direction. Like that would be his strength. Now they're trying to turn him into an edge defender, right? That's what they really want to ultimately get out of Van Ness. So when Preston Smith steps away, Van Ness can step into that that number two edge defender opposite Rashawn Gary, right? Once we get that contract done. Um, so what's really cool about Van Ness, though, watching through the preseason, people are going, yeah, but he's only got one move. He just bull rushes. He just bull rushes. That's BS. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I've seen him punch, pull, and swim. I've seen him punch, pull, and rip. I've seen him use speed to the outside now. He's starting to develop. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that he's elite with these moves, but you can see he's starting to put together his repertoire, right? He's starting to put together his his weaponry where he's going to be able to attack offensive linemen. And the one that really stands out to me, I'm telling you, he's got the bull rush. Uh, that that punch, pull, and swim looked really, really impressive in that last preseason game. So watch for Van S. And, uh, of course, Jacob's boy, Brenton Cox Jr. There's two words that come – or three words, I should say, that come to mind for me. Boom or bust. When he's on the field, you're either going to see an excellent play <laughs> – or he's going to run himself out of the play. But one thing's for sure, you're going to get 110% when it comes to effort with Brenton Cox Jr. At the linebacker position, if, if Devondre Campbell is healthy, then he's going to be even better than he was last year because he played hurt pretty much the entire season. Quay Walker is poised for a second-year jump. Michael Lombardi's all over it. He's in his red chip of linebackers uh, this year going into the season. Um, Tariq Carpenter, this is one negative i got to say, guys. He should not be on this roster. He shouldn't. And, and to me, this is where I, I don't bash Goody often. I don't disagree with him often. I'm not sitting here suggesting that I understand a value, a talent evaluation better than Brian Gutekunst. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm simply saying is 
keeping him on the roster. When you look at the tape, it's not there. Okay, he couldn't play linebacker or he couldn't pay safety, so they moved him to linebacker. You put on the tape at linebacker, it's not there. The training camp reports, it's not there. You look at the PFF grade, it's not there. And it's just one word. It's ego. It's, you know, everybody likes to bash the San Francisco 49ers, and nobody likes to bash them more than me, man. I absolutely despise the San Francisco 49ers. I love the history, the tradition of Bill Walsh, but I hate the 49ers. But I'm telling you, everybody's making fun of them for swinging and missing on Trey Lance, but the only thing worse than missing on a draft pick is refusing to admit you miss on a draft pick. And with Tariq Carpenter, what I've seen, it seems like they miss on that draft pick. You've got to be willing to acknowledge that. You've got to be willing to accept that you made that mistake. Um, that's one negative for me. At the cornerback room, uh, will Keyshawn Nixon succeed in the nickelback slot? And if he doesn't, can Valentine, uh, you know, unseat him from that role? I think Valentine's got a promise in future. Uh, I would I would not be surprised one bit if later on in the year he unseats Keyshawn Nixon for that nickel spot. I could see that happening. And then at safety, you know, it seems like it's Darnell Savage and Rudy Ford are the starters. The, the question is, can Anthony Johnson Jr. push for a midseason starter spot? And I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Not because Anthony Johnson Jr. is so great, but unless things change, I mean, the safety, the safety room is what it is, right? We've talked about it enough on here. I don't want to be the negative Nancy of the fan base, but if you see it, you got to say it. Greg Cosell, 101. We've seen it at the safety position other than Rudy Ford and it's been bad. I don't know if Jonathan Owens can cover. He's definitely a good tackler, but I don't know about being in coverage. He might be that big nickel uh, safety that comes in and plays in the box and helps with the run. Jacob, defense, defensive side of the ball, what do you think, man? Yeah, I am uh, I mean, I'm jacked. I've been a fan of TJ Slayton. I was, He was one of my guys since the time we drafted him. I think I even remember saying something about the fact of like, man, he could be our new Gilbert Brown, and then he went and did the grave digger. So that's pretty yeah, good. Grave digger. I'm telling you, I, I will never forget it. I loved it. I loved it. And then, uh, you know, Wyatt, I still have high hopes on Wyatt. He has been oddly kind of quiet, but he hasn't gotten a lot of snaps. I'm, I'm looking for him to get like a full. I'm so excited because there's so many sparks that we've seen from certain guys, but we're only looking at looking at their um, their play through a spectrum of like three, three drives. You know, typically if the guys that we really want to see, maybe something like four drives a quarter maybe a half a quarter to a two quarters top so it's like i want to see what happens when every single one of these people that are starting on both sides of the ball have to play three continuous quarters they go into the fourth quarter we talked about how emmanuel wilson lafour called him out for his his uh lack of conditioning on the defense i'd have to imagine that's even you know you're running constantly after people and you don't know what you're doing so uh, i really hope the defense has some great conditioning i want to see wyatt play a full game and maybe he can put together like a real, I, I expect him to have a really, really good jump this year uh, with Wooden Brooks. Like you talked about Brooks is just, he flashes man. And if he, it's finally really, somebody said in the chat, I don't remember who it was, something about how this is the best D line we've had since the nineties. I, I mean, it, we're kind of, it's putting the cart a little bit before the horse because we need to see it in the full, you know, full game. Like we talked about, but I, I agree, man. And and my pleasant surprise, I would say, is Jonathan Ford making the team. I really, really like him. He was another one of the late round guys that I, I just am a sucker for them. But but I think like you talked about on a different episode, Clayton, we need a guy that's another true nose. And I think that that's definitely what he he is. Um, but then you want to talk about the edge room, dude. I'm I, I that's I got that one. <laughs> He's six. the first person I thought of when I seen all six. I was like, Jacob was gonna be fired up, man. I was, you know, and and I'm not a big Hollins fan, but I have to. I just trust. Like I'm not smarter than they are. Like we talked, we talk about. I don't have a big enough ego to think. Oh, Justin Holland sucks. I watched him, and I think it was a Cincinnati game. He did a couple of really good moves. So you know, if they think if they like him, I like him. But what's more important is Gary Enigbare Smith, a guy that's just. I, I believe Smith's now developing into that more of a he's going to set the edge he's going to just be that staple there to be a, a good run defender and every now and then he does just kind of break free and gets a great pass rush so that's cool but you got you got guys younger guys with a massive motor and that have chips on their shoulder either because if you look at van s he's a first round draft pick you got to live up to that right where you're brenton cox you're undrafted you got kicked off of two teams you were the, like a five-star recruit out of high school you got a chip on your shoulder too. I mean, and it's really, really cool to see. And Igbare is a fifth round, uh, you know, slip from what people thought was maybe he's in, it was maybe even a second to third round pick. And then, you know, Hollins is a guy that nobody else wanted. And then Sean Gary, if you remember about that, people were shocked. He got taken in the first, cause he's not a pass rusher. He didn't have stats in college. He was, he was crappy at Michigan. 
Nobody wants him. He's not a team guy. He doesn't even like football, as he cried yeah. while he got drafted. And, no no yeah. doubt, man. <laughs> and uh, right. inside linebacker, that one, like you talked about, we, we, I, we, I pride myself, and we pride ourselves. And I would like to argue that we don't, we don't do a lot of fluff. When I, I log in about five minutes before we go live, we don't really talk about anything other than really general topics. We'll say, hey, we want to touch on this and this, and then that's about it. We don't usually get into topics because it's more natural when it's organic. But we, me and Clayton both could not stop, uh, could not help but talk about, hey, Tweet Carpenter made the team. How did he make the team? Like That's an ego thing, and I don't know. I, I like that the fact that he made the team because, if you remember, he is an actual – like little kid Packer fan. They showed that that picture of him as when he's like six or seven years old wearing a Packers shirt, jersey or whatever it was. So I, I'm a homer in that aspect where if but I just I don't see logically where he helps the team. We talked about it. There's there's not really a special teams presence there. He doesn't have a great defensive grade. They tried him at safety. We have five safeties there. So even if you would argue that that's a tweener there, that what is there six safety or is he our fifth? basically linebacker because i don't even think he can play linebacker and i don't know what position he fills so it is it is shocking to me a little bit otherwise um the rest of it wasn't uh, an inside linebacker too shocking at all at cornerback I, I was a little bit surprised we kept the fourth uh, or only four just because i'm a little bit worried about what nixon's going to do in the slot if you guys actually kind of put on some some spotlight on what his performance has been lately in the preseason it didn't look great but mm-hmm. it, um, he, I hope that he's just one of those gamers that kind of turns it on. And if nothing else, if he is, I really just hope that the, the, it seems like we're setting ourselves up to have a very young team that we're going to give a lot of people shots early. And if they are great, then, then we're going to give them more playing time. If I really hope that if they're not great, that we're not just going to give them playing time. Like guys like Nixon, he's a great returner. He doesn't have to be our slot if he's not performing the right way. That being said, I move on to, uh, Oh, and then Pup. Um, Stokes going on Pup. I think that's a, that's a, you know, that's interesting to think that we could even have him coming back. And I don't know necessarily what that would do if he's even game ready or what he looks like on the field. I don't know where his position falls into place there if he's just immediately on the back of the depth chart. But it's nice to know that we have a lot of depth there. And tomorrow we're going to know a lot more, honestly, I think, than we do today because the dust is going to settle. I think it's what, 11 a.m. They need to be signed back to the practice Thanks, so. okay so um and then real quick i'll get through the safeties and i'll we'll get tim's opinion here uh i was actually more shocked and i know i shouldn't have been but that, that levitt made it again because i i just <laughs> specifically just special teams that's all he is and i don't think he's that great where it would but if if rich if that's his guy like if he, it seems like he had that in his contract like you're never gonna fire this guy he's with me <laughs> and, I didn't really understand the Owens pick. It's like Simone was in there being like, you're going to sign him. She, I think she just won like another tournament or another gold or something. So that's probably, but I love seeing that Ford made it. And I love saying that Anthony Johnson jr. Made it. I really do think that he's going to fight to be a starter. Yeah. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully Ford does great. Hopefully Savage plays like a first round draft pick, but I'm not holding my breath for that. So all in all, I think it's, it's good. I would have just maybe liked to see. Yeah. I, I don't know who I would have probably replaced. I maybe would have probably taken Corey Ballantyne over um, uh, Carpenter. Is my, my yeah, completely agree with that. Completely agree, and that's what a lot of people in the chat were saying. Is like, man, I could see him keeping Dubose over Carpenter. He, Carpenter's one of those guys, and Newman too. You know, Newman too is just kind of like, man, I could, I could think of three or four players I would rather have than them on the roster. Roger Davis in the chat says, I'll consider this season a success if three things happen: one, we beat the Bears twice; two, we win nine games. And of course, we get that 65. 65%. 65%. Go, <laughs> Tim, buddy. What do you think about the defense, man? This is your cup of tea. How are we feeling about this initial 53 on the defensive side of the ball? I feel phenomenal. I feel stupendous. I feel fantastic. <laughs> and guys, hey, clearly, you know, Tariq Carpenter is on his team because clearly he's going to be the long snapper. I mean, obviously. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm joking. That was a joke, but uh, no, I, I'm really happy. I mean, <laughs> hey, if you got to tell them it's a joke, it's probably not funny. Uh, defensive line, defensive line for sure. I I got nothing to say. I'm I'm happy. I I was uh, 
kind of on the fence with uh, Jonathan Ford. I was going back and forth, whether it was him or, or maybe Chris Slayton. And I think they made the, uh, the right move there, keeping Jonathan Ford out uh, on the 53 um, outside linebacker, uh, you know, the edge, whatever we call it now, can't say enough about this group. Uh, I do think uh, Keyshawn Banks is a possible uh, practice squad pickup, maybe. Um, I noticed that Kenneth Odomegwu is listed as released, but we know that that's just a formality. He's right. guaranteed his spot. So um, on the inside, yeah, you know, can't say enough about Quay and Isaiah McDuffie, D- Dre Campbell, Eric Wilson making the team. He absolutely deserves it. Uh, I think he had a solid camp. Um, we won't talk about Terry Carpenter anymore. Uh, the corners, yeah. Um, Eric Stokes is a big uh, big question mark, you know, regardless of the injury status and, you know, or his pup status and, and how the rehab's going. Let's say he, we get him at 100%. We still do, we don't really have a great read on him you know, throughout a full season. So that can be a question mark at corner, which validates a lot of, uh, you know, our points when it, when it comes to the group of us that is saying, Hey, we could have kept another corner rather than maybe the third running back rather than maybe the fifth safety. Um, and I guess I'll just go to safety. Then, uh, Anthony Johnson jr. Puts a big smile on my face, seeing, seeing him. That was, I wasn't shocked, but, it it did kind of surprise me a little that that he did in fact make it um cuz you know the last few weeks have been kind of rough on him physically but he's uh he's proving to be a gamer and hopefully he can make a splash in that uh you know i i don't want to use the term lackluster but maybe subpar questionable safety group and jacob i agree with you it would be nice if darnell savage would play like a first round draft pick but i've been saying that for the last 4 years 3 3 3 years so i i i don't know um but crazier things have happened and we'll we will see come tomorrow morning what things look like uh, i'm assuming um you know well i don't want to assume but you know i think clayton you alluded to it probably corner is going to be a position group. They're going to probably snag at least a couple of guys for the practice squad, maybe uh Valentine um, SJC or a guy like Keandre Thomas or something. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what we're looking at going forward, but a lot to be excited about with this group uh, defensively. So go yeah, pack, go. No hey, U S cellular customers. I've got good news. So don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo Concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Good stuff, man. Yeah, I think the def- defensive side of the ball is probably the strength of this team right now. Now, how cool would it be we come out in the in the season and 
and somehow the offense, you know, lives up to that standard as well. I think that would be absolutely awesome. So uh, I'm excited, man. Again, overall, I'm happy with the way the 53 man fell, but at the same time, there was just, I think I counted two, three, maybe four moves that I was like, man, I wish they'd have done that different. But again, I'm just a dumb redneck from Tennessee. What do I know? We got a super chat here from Mike Hebring. Uh, appreciate you supporting the stream, buddy. He says, is it possible Goot will be uh, in the market for a fourth tight end? Allen to the practice squad would be one option. Jets release Zach Kuntz and uh, loved him in the draft. Yeah, you know, that's what uh, Bill Huber was talking about, Mike. We we talked about it a little bit yesterday in, in Bill Huber's article. He said that they were going to have four tight ends on the roster, but he only he only had three listed. He had a question mark. He said to be announced, like as if, you know, they'll probably claim one off of waivers. That would be an upgrade. You know, if Tyler Davis hadn't got hurt, I don't think we'd be talking about this, but the fact that they're trying to fill that void of a true tight end, a true why in this Steve in, in this offense. And I'm not trying to suggest that that Tyler Davis is, is some kind of superstar, but it's real simple. He is a traditional why tight end that can play attached. And, and what I mean by why, for those of you listening that may may not know this, you've got multiple types of tight ends in the NFL. A Y is a traditional tight end that plays attached to the offensive line. You can have Y flex, you can have Y off, you can have Y sift, all those things, but that's that traditional type of tight end. Your F tight ends are the more of the receiver type tight ends. You know, your big, tall, uh, speedy guys like your Luke Musgrave. He would be considered an F. However, they're playing him at Y, right? And and if he comes out this year and he blocks decent and holds his own against those seven techs on the defensive front, um, then I'm going to start referring to him as a Y. But right now he's kind of that F build. Now, when you go to Tucker Craft, to me, he would kind of fit that role of a U. And, and with U, I've heard some people say it stands for utility. I've heard some people say that replaced the quote-unquote H-back. I've heard some people say that Billy O'Brien, when he was with the Houston Texans, just simply named his tight ends F and U to be funny about it, you know, F U. Um, <laughs> what the truth is, but when you think of a U tight end, it's someone who can kind of do – all of the above. It doesn't mean they're great at anything, but someone who could line up in the backfield, someone who can line up, uh, you know, attached to the line, even someone you could split out wide occasionally, you know. So when you look at it from that perspective, I kind of looked at, you know, like Tunyon last year would have been, would have been considered an F tight end, right? He was the F tight end in this offense. Mercedes Lewis was that true Y, and DeGuara was more of that U, right? And we still got DeGuara on the roster, obviously. But, yeah, when you talk about, uh, you know, is it possible Goot will be in the market for a fourth tight end? Absolutely. If you had to say Clayton, you got to bet the farm on it. What position do you think they will pick up and put on the 53 tomorrow? It would probably be tight end for me. And the reason I wouldn't pick corner is because I feel like they've got a handful of corners that grade out at the same level that are going to be on the practice squad, and they feel comfortable with that. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I, I definitely think that's kind of the perspective they're coming from with that. So, Mike, hopefully that answered your question. Appreciate the super chat. Go ahead, Jacob. No, I, if I'm not – Mistaken. I think that uh, Zach Kuntz was a guy that I profiled in one of our pre-draft. Was. Yeah. Okay. Because he's a he's a physical freak too. I think that he more is kind of that um, more along that Musgrave build though. I think he's really tall, but maybe not as heavily built. I'm not exactly sure what his blocking. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But to be honest, I know if I liked him then, I'd like him now. So yeah, bring on the Kuntz. Because good at Kuntz. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Let's see, I had a couple Ooh. of messages. Here. Let, me, uh, let me try to find it real quick. I think it was Tim in the chat. Tim said it could be it could be Goot held the eleven offensive or off OL players as they are the most scare in, most scarce in the market. Hold for a bit and then trade in four to eight weeks. That could definitely be the case. Tim, I like the way you're thinking, man. You're thinking you're playing chess, not checkers, and I like it, dude. I like it a lot, especially when it comes to Newman. Yeah, God, Newman. I got to hit it one more time. Oh, no, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got another one here that I wanted to read. Andy, uh, Andy A. Pack in the chat says, do we feel like we need to add another corner or tight end? I'm a bit nervous going in with only four. I assume some of the safeties will play in a pinch. When it comes to corner, again, that's kind of the way I see it, Andy, is you're probably going to have more uh, – I don't want to say more safeties than corners active on game day, but uh, I'm. I think that – if you were to, you know, fast forward into the future and look look back on the season that's that's about to happen, you would say, yeah, it made a lot of sense that we 
uh, promoted so many corners from the practice squad from time to time. Because, again, you can lift those players from the practice squad, to the best of my knowledge, up to three times per season. And if you got a stash of three or four corners on the practice squad that you feel comfortable are in the same tier as far as uh, talent goes, then I could see them doing that. Uh, just to kind of fill in in a pinch if everyone stays healthy. Now, if those four corners stay healthy and we don't add a fifth to the to the uh, the 53 tomorrow and they all stay healthy, it's very seldom you're going to need, you know, five five corners on the field. Because even when you go to like a quarters coverage or a dollar look, most of the time you've got a safety in there, right? You've got a safety playing in one of those DB spots. It's just so rare that you have five cornerbacks on the field. You know, you can have seven DBs on the field and still only have four corners. It just depends on how you want to build the roster. And I think they're still really keying in on special teams, man. I believe that. I think that, you know, they, when they, when you sit, when you step up and you look at special teams, you think, okay, who would I rather have gun in a corner or a safety? It's going to be a safety all day long. Right. And, and Jacob, I know you're not high on down, uh, Dallin Levitt, nor was I, but I got to say this, man, when I looked at those preseason grades from that last game, PFF, I went, Dallin just made a roster again. He's going to be back because he showed enough in special teams. I think he was our uh, our leader in that final game. It might have been, even been the whole preseason on special teams. He had the highest grades. So um, let's see here. We got Blake in the chat said, I don't think Ballantyne would, would do much to save us in a pinch. Hopefully Stokes is back before the end of the year. I think he would definitely be back. Jacob, what, what do you think? You think they'll activate him off, a, off the pup probably around week four or something? Yeah, it has to be. It has to be after week four. Um I do. I just, like I said, I don't know exactly what it, so many different things can happen injury wise. God forbid that they, you know, test positive for something or like something happens. I don't know, man. It just, um, four cornerbacks seems a little it's weird, right? It's weird. Like, yeah. I don't know. And especially because I would understand it if a guy like Ennis Gaines was one of the five safeties, but yep. Yep. Somebody that was a little more of a tweener that could, in a pinch, you know, has done. I was just going to say, who out of this safety group are we comfortable putting in at corner? I think that it'd have to be uh, Anthony Johnson Jr., if I'm not mistaken, did some cornerback work at Iowa State, if if, if I'm not mistaken. But that doesn't I, make me feel better. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's, uh, let's talk about special teams for a second, fellas. Um, Anders Carlson, right? Andre Big leg. Carlson. Is it Anders? Okay. All right. We're going to Anders today. Man, call anyway. this guy. Let's get him on the line. Get him on, get him on the line. <laughs> here, here. Actually, we've got we've got Anders on the line right now. This Anders, is it Anders? It's, it's it's Anders, right? You sure about that? You sure about that? You don't even know, dude. What are we doing here? What are we doing? <laughs> special teams. So when it comes to special teams, Anders has got a big leg. And if you were to remove everything, think about this and 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 you guys are going to call me a used car salesman right now, and, and probably rightfully so. If you were to remove all of the camp reports, all of the practice reporting that happened for the beat riders, remove all that, and just simply look at what did he do in the game, I don't think we're having near as much outrage, are we? So when it comes to that, I think that, I think his uh, field goal percentage was like over, over 80%, right, in the preseason. But when you include – the practice, it was it was somewhere around 60%. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, Tim, practice is for practice, right? Like, who knows yeah. what he's got? They've got him working on in practice, right? He could be simply in there trying different angles, trying different leg angles, uh, trying, you know, different torque. Like, like Tim had talked about, he's more of a straight-on kicker. Maybe he was doing a little more soccer-style angle. He could have been working on things. And you get in front of the crowd when it matters. Okay, let's take what we implemented, and let's focus on trying to hit the field goal. And he come out and perform pretty decent, right? And yes, he missed he missed some extra points, but people pretend like extra points are just a slam dunk in today's game, and they're not, right? So I'm I'm not as worried about Anders, and I wish I would have listened to Tim a long time ago because Tim was from the get go saying R E L A X. Um, I'm not going to be surprised if he comes out this year and he just booms the freaking ball. And and you know it's funny, Michael Lombardi, Tim, he was talking about this on the GM Shuffle. He said. How many times have we – and he wasn't specifically talking about the Packers, but I think it applies. He said, how many times have we talked in the past and we've seen where teams have given up on kickers in training camp, they cut them, they go sign with another team. By the way, he specifically mentioned Daniel Carlson, right, Anders' brother. And he went on and just played freaking lots out for several years, had one of the strongest legs in the league. He's like, 
these teams are so quick to give up on kickers. And what have I been screaming all preseason? We better get Mason in here. And I'm hearing a former GM say it, Tim, and I'm going, yeah, I need to shut the hell up and listen to these guys. Maybe I'm, I'm overreacting. But how do you feel about Anders going into the year, man? Are, are we, are we, you know, about the same comfort level? Or how are you feeling? I actually feel a little better after being at the game and seeing the the 57 yarder uh, in person. Um, I I do, and I think uh, what I can attest to what you were just saying too, because I saw it at camp um, the whole month of August. Is that every day was a different. Um, kind of approach and he is he's honing it in and he's figuring out he's still figuring out that plant leg you know he had surgery on the plant on the 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 ACL I think it was on his left leg so yeah. you know how that is that can be a mental thing too having confidence in in your stride and where you're stepping and that will definitely affect all your kicks so I think uh, him just getting comfortable um, was you know that that's the process that we were looking at during camp and I think he's is most comfortable as he has been, especially when we hear about those last couple practices with uh, the guys throwing water at him and, you know, cursing out his family or whatever they were doing to distract him. And he was uh, able to find some success. And I wonder if that's almost, you know, the, you know, the trash talk from John and Rasul and the guys, you know, during practice like that, I wonder if that's what jarred, jarred everything loose kind of at the end. And he was able to just go out there on Saturday and, and boot the big ones. So, uh, I feel good about Anders Carlson, man. And I, I also feel good about uh, Whelan, too. So, you know, guys, it's it's special teams. And, you know, when when special teams is really good, nobody pays any attention. And then, you know, but when they're bad, everyone wants to jump down their throats. So I think we got to just give, give these guys time to play together. And, uh, you know, we'll see as the season progresses. But it's looking good, guys. I feel good about it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Daniel Whelan, you know, kind of, kind of the same boat as, as Anders Carlson, right? Um, strong leg. I, I think he's been more consistent than Carlson, though, right? You know, if if you were to look up at Daniel Whelan and say, okay, you've got Pat O'Donnell and you got Daniel Whelan. Daniel Whelan can kick the ball better. He's got better hang time. He's got an absolute – just a rocket for a foot, right? And the next question is, well, can he hold? I'm still in shell shock for two years ago, guys. I ain't going to BS you. Like, I'm sitting there going, I remember it like it was yesterday that we couldn't hold for a freaking kick. We couldn't snap worth a lick, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jacob, do you feel okay about Daniel Whelan? How do you feel about him being the punter, being the holder going in? I know, like you said, we watched that tape. We watched that highlight reel of him holding. He looks, he looks clean and crisp on holding for kicks. And I don't know if I'm just trying to be a Packers fanboy or what, but I'm feeling okay about Daniel Whelan being the punter. I actually feel really great about it. One, because Pat O'Donnell, don't get me wrong, I liked him, but he was, he was a bear. I don't want a Bears punter. I want our own punter. And I like that uh, it's almost like, remember when we, did we draft J.K. Scott? Am I remembering yeah. that correctly? I think so. Yeah. So maybe this, maybe this is the football gods coming down and saying, hey, we're going to give you a mulligan on that one. Here's an Irishman who can boot it out the stadium, and then after that, he can. If it, I believe, hey, 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 that's just the way we talk in the clink. <laughs> if he can actually, Basachi is the one apparently that said that his holding game has much improved throughout camp. And I mean, if you're gonna go with a rookie kicker, why not go with a rookie holder and go with a first year snapper? I mean, come on. Amen. Yeah. I really Might think well. this is the type of year where we're, we're just throwing spaghetti at the wall. We're seeing what's going to stick. And before, if you would have told me that that was our philosophy like two months ago, I would have thought, man, we're going to win like four games. But after seeing <laughs> the talent we have and seeing that the way that they are meshing together, that it's not just a flash in the pan, seeing the fact that we have a guy like Clifford in the background, seeing that we have like, – like we talked about, I would not be surprised if Anders Carlson misses like five extra points – but nails five field goals over 60 yards this year. So yeah. what do you do? Is that a trade-off? I don't know. And it looked like Daniel uh, Whelan, the, uh, Big Mac Productions again. I don't remember. I think he changed his uh, his tag on Twitter slash X, so I might have to talk to him about that. But um, he put out a, a highlight reel of all of Daniel Whelan's kicks. We should have known that he was going to make the team. He got a ridiculous amount of, of kicks to the point where it's like, did Pat even kick more than 10 times, like at all? I don't know. 
It was weird. So, yeah. And then the, the real quick, the snapper, I don't know much about him at all. They're saying that that's the guy that we're probably going to sign tomorrow correctly if, uh, what's his face? Orzich. Yeah, Orzich if, uh, in, in exchange for Tenuta. Okay. Got it. I want to take a second give a uh, special shout out to our uh, our newest members here on the YouTube uh, YouTube members list of the of the PTA posse. Um, we got Tom Spalding, we got True Bruce, Steve, Doug, and Carly Ray. Appreciate you guys supporting the channel. If you're interested in doing that, you just simply click on join on the homepage. And uh, we've we're actually going to be doing giveaways all year. Um, we've already got the next one set up, but right now coming up week one. Uh, for the post game show against the Bears, we're going to be giving away an autographed Lucas Van Ness jersey, just like this one right here over my shoulder. Um, and basically, we're going to put everybody's everybody's name on the will that's a uh, current member of the YouTube channel of the PTA Posse, and we're going to spin that sucker and give away that that uh, <laughs> we're going to give away give away that jersey. And then, of course, uh, Jacob's got actually a piece of a uh, game worn jersey of Aaron Rodgers that will be given away to second place on that. So we're going to spin it twice that night. Really excited about doing that. And again, it's just an opportunity to kind of, to kind of give back to those who are supporting the channel. We really appreciate you guys uh, doing that. We got Garrett in the chat as Jacob shows off the, the uh, memorabilia there. Garrett in the chat says uh, Ryan Schlipp addressed the bears O line on a recent pod and their PFF scores are atrocious and they're a little banged up too. If I remember Garrett, Garrett, I'm pretty sure they're battling some injuries, man. I'm telling you, if Rashawn Gary is ready week one, guys, I, I'm, I am so excited about it. Dude, listen, I'm going to say it like I've said it a thousand times. Is there a chance we lose to the Bears? Absolutely, there's a chance. But to, anyone who tries to convince you that the, that the Packer fans have just been running their mouth and the Bears fans aren't, the Bears have talked so much crap this offseason. Their fans have just – it's just a slam dunk, take it to the bank, the Packers will suck for the next 20 years because they no longer have a Hall of Fame quarterback and they are going to smoke our heads in week one. I can't wait for it to get here. I cannot wait for it to get here. Jacob, what do you think? How many times do you think we will sack Justin Fields in the Bears game? So that's where I'm uh, – I, I really, really hope that we don't go – like I'm trying to not say the word I'm trying to say. I hope we don't go all gas – no break. Uh, my man, my man is he's growing and changing every day. I love yeah. it. I don't want yeah, uh, he not only rambled, but he rumbled and stumbled. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want us to be so jacked up about we want to get to the quarterback because that's Justin Fields' best, uh, you know, technique that he uses. He's not a good quarterback, but he's good at running. He's a running back. So, for instance, I see in the chat here, Garrett saying, hey, Jacob, if Cox, if Cox gets a sack or a turnover versus the Bears, you get a jersey. Number one, yes. But number two, I almost <laughs> don't want to see him in that position because I, the one big knock on Brenton Cox Jr., I'm going to keep saying his full name because we're going to keep, keep getting de demonetized if I don't say his full <laughs> name. So, uh, it's Cox not that, Jr. Jacob. It's just it's us trying to be – too funny at the wrong moments. And I say us, not just you. It's me. And Tim can play innocent all he wants. He giggles back there, too. He's guilty by association. <laughs> uh, done deal. Uh, we've seen his Achilles heel is that sometimes he just rushes and he puts his head down. Open, man. <laughs> does not care what happens if, if he lets out outside contain, if he lets, you know, an inside run. He just kind of all of a sudden. So I don't want to see them put him in that position, and I don't want to see our guys on the outside losing contain, but I'm very much more hopeful that we have guys on the interior now like Wyatt, Kenny Clark, Wooden, Brooks, that can kind of just have a little more oomph to their – little more hitch to their giddy-up, you know, and that they have a little more pursuit. We have – I want Clay Walker shadowing – Freaking Justin Fields. That's what I want. And I want to yep. be able to be in coverage. Cause if that's, if we can somehow make that work throughout, I feel like that's right now, make him throw the ball, make him throw the ball. Amen. Rush three all day. Make them throw it. He make them throw it. A hot pile of burning garbage, a baby diaper rotting in the sun. He is the worst. God. Sounds horrible. Yeah. Are you kidding me, dude? It's a good thing. They got a tailback as a quarterback in Chicago. Cause they're going to need it. What's up? Did you say a rotten baby diaper bacon in the sun? Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, what brings me to my next point? Don't smoke crack. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We keep getting these uh these little notifications from YouTube that 
the ads are going to be limited because of something we said. And I'm trying to narrow it down. Like, what did we say inappropriate? It's all of it. It's all of this stuff. It's got. <laughs> How does Mac time anyway. though? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Steve, Steve is real. Yeah, in the chat says not to change topics. How about those Irish? How about the Irish, Clayton? Uh, were you impressed? I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is a Packers podcast. But yes, yeah, Steve, uh, Sam Hartman's a real deal, dude. And he better be. He's 43 years old, right? Starting quarterback for a college team. I think the Irish are set up pretty nice this year. And, and again, I love college football because it feeds the NFL, you know. But uh, and Notre Dame's just got that traditional tie uh, to Green Bay. You know, I was going to say the thing. Notre Dame. Didn't we get like our first practice uniforms from them? And that's the the horrible kind of navy blue ones that everybody hates. Yeah. That see, so uh, base. Basically, the ties there with Notre Dame, there's multiple ties. Um, I'm sure I'll screw some of this up because I don't have my notes in front of me. But essentially, Curly Lambeau, he got – first of all, he went to play football at Wisconsin and when he left East Green Bay High. And then when he found out, he pretended like he didn't know. Like, what do you mean freshmen don't get to start? So they weren't going to let him start. So he transferred to Notre Dame, and he played one year under Newt Rockney, okay, at Notre Dame. And that one year under Newt Rockney – um, he ended up getting, uh, I think it was tonsillitis or strep throat or something, and he almost died. So he had to move back to Green Bay. And when he moved back to Green Bay, that's where he ran into George Calhoun on the streets. And George Calhoun said, hey, you should start a Sandlot team. And George Calhoun, I'm, uh, I've actually taken the pictures down, but I had a picture of a side-by-side shot right here on the wall before we put the stock up instead. But it was George Calhoun and Curly Lambeau. They're co-founders of the Green Bay Packers. So that's how the Packers came about. But Curly also coached baseball and football for a few years there in Green Bay, he ended up coaching a player that went on to be one of the four horsemen for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, okay? So, yeah, when they started the Packers, essentially what Curly was doing was bringing the colors of Notre Dame to Green Bay because when they first started, they had like a navy blue and and kind of a tan and all that, um, which uh, I know everybody hated those jerseys when they wore the throwbacks, but I absolutely love them. I, I love, love them. Dude. Me too, and man. They were like, all oh, the brown pants are crap. Dude, it was traditional. You know, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, people made fun of the eight. They said it was the pool ball, right? Well, they put a pool ball on the front of the jersey. That's stupid. You got to understand at that time, pro football was so broke that that was like the fact that they put that number on the front of the jersey like that and that extra fabric. They were like, whoa, these guys are big time. Like it was a big <laughs> deal. Back and yeah. of course, they wore the brown helmets. Why the hell are they wearing brown helmets? It signified the leather helmets. Like, and a lot of a lot of guys didn't even get their own number. They just wore whatever the hell got thrown to them that day. <laughs> Go look, look up how many l- numbers Curly Lambeau wore when he played. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and and we found out this year when Jaden Reed got drafted, someone you know when they posted he's wearing number one, I was like on Twitter, I was like, holy cow, they gave him Curly Lambeau's number. They're like, no, what? Curly wore forty two or Curly wore twenty four. It's like Curly wore a lot of numbers, but you got to understand that in in Packers history, their tradition is no one will ever wear the number one because that that was that set aside for Curly Lambeau, the very first Green Bay Packer, the founder of the the co founder of the Green Bay Packers, the first captain, the first coach. All of that, right? Um, so uh, soon after that, don't get me wrong, people ridiculed me. Though, you don't know what you're talking about. He's wearing number one. They announced it. And then all of a sudden it came out that he's going to wear number 11 because whoever issued that to him made a big boo-boo. Big <laughs> boo-boo. So that's, uh, I thought that was cool that they stepped up, though, and prevented it because it, it is important and tradition is important. And people say, well, why, why isn't his name on the facade? It is. It's all over the field. It's Lambeau Field. Another quick fact, too, and we're getting ready to wrap up. You guys get me talking on history, man. I'll run every damn listener off. They, nobody will be left on the stream. Um, but when when they when Curly Lambeau passed away, I think it was in nineteen. Um, I think it was in nineteen sixty five. I can't remember the exact year. Whatever year Curly Lambeau died, he was uh, up in the Sturgeon Bay area when he passed away. But when he passed away, the committee came together and basically told Lombardi, hey, we're going to rededicate the field and name it because it was called New City Stadium. They said we're going to name it Lambeau Field. Lamb or uh, uh, Vince Lombardi was livid. Vince Lombardi absolutely despised Curly Lambeau, despised <laughs> him because Vince Lombardi was this family man. He was big on faith. He was a Catholic Christian. He was all these things and represented hard work and and being honest and this and that. And Curly Lambeau had been married seventy three times and was just a womanizer <laughs> partier. They did not see eye to eye. So you can actually find it real easy online. You can find the program that year. Um, not the year he died, but the first year that 
Curly Lambeau was invited back to New City Stadium when the stadium was built. They've actually got footage of him walking into the stadium. It is so iconic. It's it's like crackling. The film's crackling. It looks like something out of a horror movie or something. It's absolutely awesome. But on the front of that program, I think it was in 1965, is a picture of Curly Lambeau and Vince Lombardi shaking hands. And the look that Lombardi has given him, he's smiling, but he is staring a hole through this guy. I mean, it's just – I love it. I love it. Because George Calhoun and Curly Lambeau had a fallen out as well, right? They ended up hating each other by the time they passed away. George Calhoun had a favorite, a famous quote where he said – that when when uh, he he said I hope I live long enough uh, I hope I outlive Curly so I can pee on his grave he actually said that. <laughs> so I just love the fact that they have all these little rivalries behind behind the scenes man I just think that stuff is is absolutely awesome it's so cool man. It's so so cool so uh, all right anything else before we get ready to wrap up here Jacob I see your chat there man um, anything else you want to hit on before we uh, wrap this big bear up. No, nah, dude, I'm just I'm excited. I think, again, tomorrow is going to be another great episode. So stay tuned for that, because I'm just saying uh, it's like Clayton said, there's gonna be a little bit of, of mix ups and, and shake ups. And we'll probably see a more finalized, settled down roster tomorrow. And it's probably maybe only going to be two or three pieces that shift a little bit. But who knows? Because in that amount of time, by the time we go live, which I'm thinking what you're thinking, seven o'clock central ish tomorrow. Yeah, sounds good. Because that's uh, we should I, should, I shouldn't say we should, but it's possible that we could be picking up other guys, making some cuts again. So I don't know, man. This is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind as we get ready for. Um, I mean, what are we out? Is is football start Thursday from this Thursday, officially? Yeah, yep. and it's, isn't it KC or something like that? What's that? I think the first game's KC versus Lions, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, KC and Detroit. So we'll we'll, we'll see if the hop is real with Detroit. If go. they get ran out of the stadium, we'll know. Okay, maybe they're taking a step back. But I think KC is going to be ready to be ready to roll for sure. This one, uh, this this chat, I probably shouldn't share it, but I'm going to anyway. It cracked me up. He said, "Imagine if Curly <laughs> Curly Lambo had a smartphone, he'd be Brett Favre." <laughs> you think God never farted? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And the split screen game and rather play with the whiskey drinkers than the milk drinkers. Just saying, yeah, that's an old saying too, man. That's a, that's a good one as well. Um, so yeah, but like you, like, I guess you were alluding to split screen game. I'm, I'm reading through so many comments. It's hard for me to keep up. What time uh, do you guys start streaming? Yeah. Typically seven central eight Eastern is going to be our standard time. Now when we do post game shows, we'll go live immediately following the game. So uh, yeah, that's uh that's it. Um, and um, real go ahead. Quick. Split Screen Gaming also said at 7.57, so just a few minutes ago, said, also just got my copy of Take Your Eye Off the Ball today. I worked on <laughs> the store, so it was half off. I'm telling you guys, get this freaking book. I have been so busy at work, I haven't been able to get through more than like three chapters, but it's, I, every time, I've never been, and now I, this is how I know I'm getting old, because I have to find time to read a book. And if I want to take <laughs> like a vacation, people are like, what are you going to do? Tomorrow's my birthday, so I'm going to take, I got the day off, and people are like, what are you going to do for your birthday? And I was like, I'm going to catch up on some reading. And they were like, oh, that's You're like, cool. what? I was like, no, it's Take cool. I sent, I sent Clayton a picture. I bought like four or five books. Uh, the most, the most excited I am to read though, is definitely the take your eye off the ball. Clayton's been talking about it for since I've known him. So, so it's uh, and it, it definitely, it runs you through the ins and outs of everything about football. It's like the nitty gritty. I don't want to say it's like a, football for dummies it's more it's like super intricate but it breaks down in a really readable relatable way so that you really understand the nuts and bolts from the gm to the practice squad to the way that they train it's really cool and then they get into the specifics of the formations and all that the terminology it's super super cool it's great man it's it's just a it, you know, you, you get these books, it's, uh, you know, football for dummies and this and that. And, and you think, oh, this would be a good foundational book, man. It, it is way too dumbed down. Pat Kerwin does an excellent job of take your eye off the ball, man. You're going to come away way more knowledgeable about the game. I've read it. Like I said, I know I've read it at least three times, probably more. I've got it on audio book as well. Sometimes when I'm out there on the ground during the work week, I'll pop that thing. Can in you send me the audio book? I can't find it anywhere. Yeah. So when it first released, there was some extra material that came out with 2.0. And actually a disc, I've got a DVD. Dude. That it's literally a visual. It's Pat Kerwin on a glass board, a glass, you know, I guess you'd call it a chalkboard, ink board, whatever, grease board. And he's actually drawing this stuff up that he's talking about in the book. It's phenomenal. I need to find that. 
um, and uh, and get get you a copy for sure. But yeah, split screen gaming, man, awesome. Congratulations on picking up that book. I'll give you one of these. Huh? Took it down the sideline, turned over with my guys, gave the football to a little kid wearing twenty three. Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> um, Tim, your final thoughts, man, before we go to this super chat from Godsmack. Oh man, uh, I guess guys, who do we who do we think we're gonna we're gonna pick up? A uh, couple couple names that we might uh, might get get after the waiver period. You know, like I said, uh, Corey Ballantyne jumps out um, on the on the defensive side. So does Keyshawn Banks, um, and offensively, you know, names like uh, Jada Kiss Bonds, uh, even Cody Crest. Hell, we might see Alex Magoo on the practice squad. So I think he probably will, Tim. Either him yeah. or, or or maybe Danny Etling will be uh re or uh, what what do you call it? resurrected. <laughs> right. Yep. That yep. could happen. So. Amen to that. So just kinda going over my list of the, the releases and uh seeing who will be back at twelve sixty five here, hopefully uh starting tomorrow here we should start to find out. So looking forward to uh the rest of the process here as we go into week one. Excited yeah, for this definitely. season, guys. Definitely. We'll end it with this super chat. It's going to be on a negative note, but man, I feel I feel his pain a little bit. God smack. Thank you for the super chat, but we appreciate you supporting the stream. He said, "Did did Newman really make the fifty three? No way. He was one of our best fifty three players. He should go eat fifty three cheeseburgers and retire. Waste of a roster spot." Hello, Newman. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's exactly what I thought when I seen the final roster. Man, uh, not not about the burgers, about the hello Newman. I was like, oh man. Newman survives again. May hey, look, man, he's a Packer, right? I hope he turns it around. I hope he proves us all wrong. Yeah. But just like Greg Cosell says, if you see it, you got to say it. Yep. And my man has struggled this last little bit, man. It's it's been been really, really, really ugly. So uh, again, Godsmack, thank you for the support, buddy. We really, really appreciate it. Also, want to uh, again give a special thanks to Mike Hebring for the super chat. I don't think I missed anybody else. All of our YouTube members, thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. Uh, you guys are absolutely awesome. So we're going to get out of here. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about any other news we got, and we'll come up with some good topics, and we'll let you guys kind of steer the ship as well. So, again, special shout-out, and thanks to Old Southern Barbecue Smokehouse becoming the official sponsor of Packernet Podcast. Really excited about that partnership. For those of you listening on the pod, thank you for making us a part of your day. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world, and go Pack Go. The power sweep. Actually, it's the... It's a lead play in our, in our offense. Tell the tackle, the defensive end, if he's over, if he's not, you drive down the first man who is inside. Pull back and get him. Take the first man outside the offense. Exactly. No one shows. Go right by them and feel this back. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker in, he comes all the way around. To look at this play, we'll be trying to get a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. <clears throat>